Are you a fan of Subway sandwiches? Did you know that Subway is the largest fast food chain in the world with over 44,000 locations in 110 countries? But do you know the crazy truth about the history of Subway? It all started with a 17-year-old Bronx boy who had never made a sub before, the store's first day of business. And the story gets even more interesting from there. In this video, we will take a deep dive into the fascinating history of Subway, uncovering the incredible journey that led to the massive success of the company we all know and love today. So stick around until the end to discover the truth about the amazing story behind Subway. Fred DeLuca was born in Brooklyn in 1947 to a factory worker and a housewife. When he was five years old, his family relocated to a housing project in the Bronx. After Fred's father business moved five years later, they were forced to relocate once more, this time to Schenectady, New York. The DeLucas' way of life improved there. The DeLucas and Pete and Haiti Buck, a different couple, grew close friends and frequently gathered for picnics and parties. However, the families lost contact after Fred graduated from high school because the DeLucas moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut, which was out of state. The Bucks moved to Armonk, New York, about 40 miles away from Bridgeport a year later. They invited the DeLucas after they had settled in. Fred had just graduated from high school and wanted to go into medicine at the time. He had been accepted into a pre-med program, but he wasn't sure whether he should accept because of his limited financial resources. He did not see how he could pay for college given his family's modest financial situation. He worked as a store clerk at a hardware store, earning $1.25 an hour. While this was a respectful wage for a young person, it was insufficient to pay for college. Fred visited the new house of the Buck family, a big white house with two garages and his feelings of hopelessness vanished. He reasoned that Pete, the homeowner, was doing well for himself and might be able to offer Fred advice on how to pay for college. Fred even had a secret wish that Pete would give him a loan. Fred waited for a chance to speak with Pete alone the entire afternoon. He finally worked up the courage to bring up the subject while standing in the middle of Pete's lawn. He said he wanted to go to college but didn't have the money and asked Pete if he had any ideas of how he could pay for his education. Pete responded without any hesitation. I believe you ought to start a sub shop. Fred was surprised. He had been hoping for a different response, not this one. He and his family were unable to start a business because they could not even afford to pay for college. He had never made a sub before and he was only 17 years old. Nevertheless, Fred was curious and asked Pete to describe the operation of the company. Pete explained that all he needed to do to start a business was to rent a small store, erect a counter, and purchase some supplies. When the customers arrived and paid for their subs, Fred would have all the money he required to cover the cost of his college education. Despite the fact that Pete was a nuclear physicist and had no prior business ownership experience, the answer seemed simple to him. He even offered to work with Fred because he was so sure his plan would succeed. It seemed like a fantastic opportunity to Fred, a young person from the Bronx housing project, and he concurred. Pete then read an article about Mike's subs from a newspaper clipping he had in his home. Michael Davis, the founder, opened his business with almost no money and overcame many obstacles to establish a modest empire in upstate New York with 32 restaurants in 10 years. Why can't we do this if Michael can? Pete inquired. By the end of the evening, Fred and Pete had created a menu, decided on a price, and established a target of opening 32 restaurants in 10 years. Pete gave Fred his first investment, a $1,000 check before he left. Neither of them had any idea that it would bring in a billion dollars or that they would have to make it through almost 10 years without making a profit. The following day, Fred located a store to rent in Bridgeport. Although it was reasonably priced and in good condition, customers had trouble finding the location. Despite this, Fred and Pete quickly came to an agreement with the landlord and decided not to sign a lease because they believed it would be too expensive to hire a lawyer. Pete and Fred took a trip to learn how to make subs. Amato's, a neighborhood Italian deli in Portland, Maine, 
where Pete grew up eating subs, was their first stop. They also went to other stores and talked about their experiences, deciding that Mike's and Amato's were their favorites. They made the decision to combine the best employees from both restaurants and sell their subs at Mike prices. They handed out flyers to strangers to publicize the opening of their store, Pete Submarines, which they intended to open in August. They sold over 300 subs on opening day, forcing them to close because they were out of ingredients. Fred and Pete had high expectations for the repeat business and referrals of their initial clients, which they believed would result in a sharp increase in sales. However, the customers they had at first never returned, and there weren't many new ones either. Despite their efforts to boost sales and even spending money on an expensive radio ad, they couldn't stop the downwards trend in sales from month to month. Eventually, Fred and Pete were unable to pay their employees' wages or the rent, and they were forced to shut down their business. L-T-D-A-T-A-T-K, which stands for Lock the Door and Throw Away the Key, was Pete's suggestion. This suggestion surprised Fred because he believed the company was still too young to give up on. After considering their options, they made the risky decision to open a second store in Fairfield, Connecticut. This was justified on the grounds that having two stores would enable them to test out various products and evaluate their outcomes. Additionally, they thought that having two stores would give the impression that their subs were in high demand. Their wager was successful, and the second shop did well. The following year, they added a third store, and each of the three saw an immediate increase in sales. However, they soon discovered that their industry was highly seasonal and that the winter was particularly bad for sales. Despite this setback, Fred and Pete remained persistent and waited patiently for their company to recover. Their persistence paid off, and as consumers' eating habits changed, their reputation grew and their business became more stable over time. Due to his dislike of laboratory work, Fred gave up on his dream of becoming a doctor and changed his major to psychology, the only field that accepted his course credits. His only goal was to graduate, and he intended to make a decision about his career later. He was nevertheless committed to achieving the goal he and Pete had established, opening 32 restaurants in 10 years. Fred opened 16 restaurants 8 years after the opening of Pete Submarines. He consulted William Rosenberg, the creator of Dunkin' Donuts, for advice after realizing he couldn't reach his target of 32 in just two years. William urged him to start franchising and to open stores in places where people could park their cars. Fred adopted this suggestion and changed the name of his company to Subway. Although Subway didn't achieve its goals of opening 32 restaurants in 10 years, it did open more than 5,000 locations in the following 10 years. Subway continued to enjoy great successes during this time, and Fred saw his position there as his career. In 2000, Subway gained national attention when Jared Fogel, a college student, lost 245 pounds after consuming Subway's subs for a year. As a result of Jared's success as a spokesperson for Subway and his appeal to average Americans, the company's sales eventually tripled. Subsequently, a Subway franchisee, Stuart Frankel came up with the concept of $5 footlong subs, which initially saw its sales jump from $14,000 to $23,000 per week. Although corporate management was doubtful that the promotion would work on a national scale, they eventually gave in. The promotion was a huge success, bringing in billions of dollars before becoming a stable. Despite various issues concerning food, ambassadors, and franchisees, Subway remains the world's largest fast food chain, surpassing McDonald's and KFC, with restaurants in over 110 countries. In his book, Fred underscores the importance of getting started, stating that many individuals believe that ordinary people with limited resources and common ideas cannot accomplish great things. However, the way the real world works is more surprising than most people realize, and the key is to get started rather than focus on money. Wow, what a journey it has been exploring the crazy truth about the history of Subway. From a 17-year-old Bronx boy's dreams of paying for college to the world's largest fast food chain with over 44,000 locations in 110 countries, Subway's success story is nothing short of inspiring.
We've learned how the power of determination, hard work, and the courage it takes to take risks can pay off in a big way. Fred DeLuca's story teaches us that sometimes all it takes is one idea, one person, or one note in a notebook to change your life forever. Subway has come a long way since its humble beginnings in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Today, it offers a wide range of subs, salads, and other delicious menu items that cater to all tastes and preferences. But the legacy of Fred DeLuca lives on, inspiring future generations of entrepreneurs and dreamers to chase their dreams and make them a reality. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.